Hey guys, this is Srini and welcome back to continue the discussion about HAM 10,000 dataset that we started in the last tutorial. In fact, in the last tutorial, we looked at how to load the dataset, a couple of ways to load the dataset, and we're going to use one of those methods to load the dataset and of course to classify it. But just a quick reminder, what is HAM 10,000 dataset? It's a great dataset to practice multi-class classification, uh, whether you're do, doing deep learning or any other type of uh, uh, machine learning, for example, this can be a great data set, uh, primarily because, uh, first of all, it's it's tough to classify these images, and to add to the complexity, the data is heavily imbalanced. So this is a great practice data set, okay? And also it leads to a real application. We're working on something that can be potentially a real application here, okay? Now, a quick thing, uh, this data set is just a, a quick note. You have 10,015 images, again, a summary of last uh, video, and, uh, uh, and they are classified into one of the seven classes, okay, uh, given right here. Again, if you are a biologist who understands these, great. If not, think of this as cats, dogs, houses, uh, you know, uh, seven such classes, except these are not as easy a bit uh, more complex. As you can see, some of these images, for example, that image uh, that's classified as BCC and this image that's classified as DF, uh, to me visually look they uh, very similar, but obviously they are classified as something different, right? So even from visual inspection, you'll see some of these like this one image uh, classified as BCC, this one classified as DF. I don't even know how uh, even a uh, human can tell the difference between these. So to get an accuracy of anything above 60% uh, or 70%, uh, let alone 80% is uh, uh, challenging. Okay, let's see what we can do about it and how we can get to at least 70% today. And uh, again, there are a couple of resources. I'll leave the links to these in uh, the description. Now let's uh, actually go ahead and jump in uh, before we waste any time, okay? And uh, one quick note before getting into the actual code, and if you're a regular watcher of my channel, that's why I encourage you to subscribe to my channel, is uh, we talked about autocaros in one of the videos. And autocaros is where it can check uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 different models for a given problem, of course, on a smaller data set. And then it can say, okay, hey, based on these, this is the best model for you, right? So I thought of giving this a try, and I did do that with a smaller, much smaller uh, subset of the data and it gave me a model saying that hey use these three convolutional layers uh, 256 and 128 and 64 and then add a dense layer and this would be the best one for you right and that's exactly what I'm going to use right now now in case you wonder what I have done is I, I uh, obviously I loaded the data and I tried to uh, balance the data we'll get to that in a minute but basically I uh, Let's get to the final point. I split the data into such a small data set, like small in the sense I have probably 100 images in each of these, and uh, uh, and ran this, uh, where is it? Uh, image classifier, auto classifier dot image classifier with a max trials of 25, meaning it checked 25 different models. And for each model, it did 25 epochs and, uh, and, and uh, uh, came back to me with the best model that it thinks would be appropriate for, for, this, uh, for this problem. This is exactly what I did. I looked at it and I'm like, okay, I printed the model, right? Model.summary and I put together that exact model down here. So if I go down the code here, it says, okay, convolutional 2D, 256 uh, and the next one has 128 and next one has 64 filters and then of course uh, go ahead and do your dense th uh, 32 uh, dense and uh, output layer of seven nodes okay uh, using softmax uh, using softmax because we are doing multi-class classification and uh, for loss functions, again, this is where you can use uh, experiment a bit. I'm using categorical cross entropy optimizer. Also, you can experiment a bit. I'm using Adam. So these are all very simple, straightforward ones. Okay, now let's get back and look at how to handle data. Well, please watch my previous video in terms of how to handle data. Uh, but I'll explain this method as we go along. Okay, so first let's go ahead and import the libraries. And uh, while it's doing that, it should be pretty quick. Okay, uh, all I'm trying to do is basically for plotting using PyPlot, NumPy, Pandas, uh, Glob to walk through the folder structure. 
Seaborn to plot uh, my confusion matrix later on when I do that, uh, and uh, pillow image function to actually uh, load the images because it makes it easy for us to resize image and convert them into NumPy array. You can use OpenCV or scikit image if you want. I'm fixing the random seed so when I repeat this experiment, my results are a slightly more predictable rather than completely uh, random. Uh, or repeatable, I should say, not predictable. And I'm using confusion matrix from scikit-learn. Um, did I run these lines? No. Uh, yeah, I think I did. Uh, confusion matrix, so we can plot, we can calculate the confusion matrix between the predicted and true uh, outputs, Y values. And Keras is pretty straightforward. And I'm going to import two categorical Y because this is multi-class classification. So just uh, having labels of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is not going to be enough. It should be in a categorical format. Again, I'm not going to explain each of this. Watch my video on uh, uh, one hot encoding uh, sequential method to create our uh, to create our model and we are going to use dense layers drop out flatten regular stuff okay uh, and we are going to use test train uh, train test split to split our data into training and testing data sets and stats to do some basic stats and label encoder to convert our la labels of NV and B, K, L or whatever those labels into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, because we have seven classes. Okay, so, so far you should have a good uh, understanding of the libraries. Now let's go ahead and read the metadata, right? I mean, again, how is our data set? Our data set is if you go into, oops, sorry. If you go into data, our data is in HAM 10,000 folder or directory with two subdirectories and the metadata in CSV format. So the plan is to look at the metadata, the file name, image ID, which is, uh, for example, this is image ID and this one is another image ID. For each of these image ID, let's find the entire path where the file is located and load that file into the pandas data frame. Again, the method I talked in the last video. So first of all, let's go ahead and read the CSV file. Okay, let's open the CSV file. So in case you haven't watched the previous video, you can see it. Okay, this is basically it. So there is a lesion ID, image ID. What is the classification? The DX is the classification. Okay, you can change that to label if you want, if you think DX is too cryptic. And uh, the type, age, sex, and localization. So what we care about is DX. Oh, sorry. What we care about is this DX and image ID. Okay. So um, let's uh, have a quick look at it, sorry. Yeah, DX and image underscore ID. Okay, so now let's uh, define our size to be 32. I want to load, uh, resize our images into 32 by 32. You can try 64 by 64. I tried both and my accuracy wasn't that different. Slightly better with 64 uh, images. And my system could handle 64 GB, uh, I mean, sorry, 64 by 64 pixel size. Okay, uh, the next thing is let's go ahead and convert our labels because our labels right now, we just saw the DX, it says BKL and what else, uh, uh, MEL, NV, BCC and so on. So to convert that into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm going to use my label encoder. How do you do that? You first instantiate that LE and then you fit that onto your DX and label encoder right there and then go ahead and print it so you can actually see, oh, did I not print it? There you go. So these are all the labels that we have. Okay. And now let's go ahead and transform these labels, right? We haven't transformed them yet. We just fit it. So now let's go ahead and transform those and capture the transformed values into a new column called label. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, if you print this, you should see, well, let's actually open it because we can. Let's open our skin DF. And if I expand this, you should see another new column called label. And all the BKLs are apparently label two. If I go down, label fours and so on. Okay, all the basic stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's go ahead and plot them to give a quick idea of how these are going to look like. Um, so there you go. Okay, this is all, it's always a good idea to have a quick look at how your data uh, looks like, right? I mean, before jumping in. As I mentioned earlier, again, is there a figure size? Let's actually change this to 12 by eight. Okay, now let's plot it again. Okay, slightly more readable, but let's not worry about it. I'll probably digitally zoom in. Now you can see our NV has over 6,000 data points. 
and then the next one has a bit of uh, over 1000 and 1000 data points bcc is about 500 this is 300 these two are 100 and 100 heavily heavily uh, uh you know not balanced at all and if you look at the uh, uh, split between male and female that's not bad uh, that's fine although we are not using that information today at all and if you look at uh, where these lesions actually came from is it back is it lower extremity is it trunk uh, as you can see, again, this is not a balanced data set if you plan on using this as part of your classification. Okay, and age itself, again, distribution, average age, uh, mean age, I should say, is about like 45-ish or so. So this gives a quick idea of what we are dealing with in terms of data, spread of data. But this is of concern to me because we are classifying them into one of these seven classes. Not having good balance is a concern. Let's address it first because what I do not want is load all the images and then worry about, oh, how do I only take a subset of this, right? First, even before doing that, let's actually look at how we can balance it. Again, many ways to balance this. In fact, you can load all of this and during training, you can actually put weights and you can say, okay, my uh, uh, these three have a different weight. You can automatically calculate weights, by the way. And these have different weights and this one has different weights, right? So you can do that during training. I don't like that. I like to balance things first. So the way I do that is, first of all, let's go ahead and look at how these are spread. I mean, visually we saw that, but if you just look at the numbers, 6,700 of these, 1,000, 1,500 of these, and so on. So to me, maybe everything, all of these to 500 is a pretty good number. So what if I can just take randomly 500 of uh, images from this class, 500 from here, 500 from here, 500 from here, and upscale these to 500, meaning it uh, randomly copies some of these images and duplicates them and makes them 500. Not ideal, but it is what it is. So that's exactly what I'm going to do later on. What I'm doing is to uh, skin DF, I'm just looking at all the rows where the value equals to zero, capture that into a new data frame called DF0. When I run that, now I have DF0 with 327 entries because that's how many values I have for zero. I'm going to do exactly that for each of these classes. There's much better ways of uh, handling this, but this is how I chose to do it. Why am I separating each class so I can augment them individually? Okay, uh, so let's put number of samples as 500. Let's, like I just explained, and I'm going to use the resample that we, let's go back up right there scikit-learns.utilities there is something called resample okay and resample does exactly what it's uh, uh, what it says up there it resamples it into how many it into how many ever we want like 500 and if it is more than 500 it downs downscales to 500 if it is less than it it brings it up to 500 that's all it's doing okay let's go ahead and run these lines so at the end of this if you just look at all of these data sets balanced balanced they should all have 500 each okay this is how i chose to balance you don't have to do that you can follow if you have a better way leave it in the comments uh, uh, if you have a better way that enhances the accuracy, leave it in the comments so others can learn from it. Now I'm combining all of these, uh, basically our pandas.concatenating, right? So I'm concatenating or putting all of these back together into one single data frame called a skin DF balance. So if I go back to my skin DF balance, I have 3,500 data points, five times seven, right? 500 times seven, and all the columns, including you know, uh, the entire original data frame is, is put back together here. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at how many data points, obviously 500 in each of this. So this is balanced data set. Okay, now what do we do? I'm going to, uh, let's run this line and then you can actually see image path is not defined. Let's go ahead and run this line. Obviously we haven't done that. Again, I explained this in the last tutorial. What is it trying to do? It's basically looking at my uh, path and then uh, and then uh, uh, looking at the subfolders. When it does that line, again, go ahead and run this uh, line by line, right? When you do that, it's going to give it these two folder names, right? Part one and part two. The first it goes to part one, right? First it goes to part part one and then it goes to part two and it is going to extract everything that has an extension of JPEG and it's going to return the path of each of those. So when I run this, if you look at image path, if you look at image path, 
You see the image path is ISIC 0024 and this is the entire path to this image. Why am I doing this? So I can now use this to load that image and add it to my pandas data frame, right? So that's exactly what we are doing down here. So first of all, let's add that to our original data frame, which is our balanced data frame, skin underscore df balanced, right? So to the label, I'm adding another one called path, and this path is this entire path of this image. Now I can basically run a function that goes through each and every one of these entries and does something. What is that something? Use pillow to load an image, resize the image, convert that to a NumPy array, add it right next to this into a new column. That's exactly what a Lambda function does if we ask it to do that. So here, this Lambda function, what it's doing is, okay, uh, for each of this entry, meaning for each of this X, go ahead and image.open, right? You open the image, resize it to 32 by 32, convert that to NumPy array and add it into a new column called image, skin df balanced image. Let's go ahead and run this line. This will take at least two to three minutes on my system. Now what we are doing is we are loading 3,500 images and converting them to 32 by 32 and adding them to our pandas data frame. Make sure you have enough RAM. If not, use the image data generator method that I talked about in the previous uh, tutorial. So let me pause this video for a few more seconds. Uh, why waste the time? Uh, and once the data frame is ready, let's go ahead and continue, okay? That was actually very uh, quick. It's done because it's only 3,500 images and not 10,000 images. So if I open my skin DF uh, balanced and scroll all the way to the end, you should see a new folder uh, sorry, new column called image. And this is where we have our image. And if I click in, you can see all the pixel values. These are all, again, 8-bit uh, values. That's why they are going from 0 to 255. We should, we can, we should uh, normalize them to values between 0 to 1 uh, or scale the values between 0 to 1, or you can also normalize it if you want. Okay, so we have everything we need now. So let's go ahead and proceed. So first of all, let's plot these images. Again, we did this in the last video. Uh, and if I go to plots, you should see these are all the images and these are all the different classes, yeah? So for VASC class, these are how the images look like, okay? So we know that we got the images ready. Next step. First of all, if you look at uh, your data, now we have a data frame with a whole bunch of columns. We care about two columns. One is uh, the image itself, right? And the second one is the label, which is labeled as, uh, the column is labeled as DX. So let's assign the image to X and the label to Y, because every machine learning, you have X uh, that you train on to predict Y, right? So let's do that. So what is our X? Our X is our, uh, uh, our data frame with the column image and convert that to list. Otherwise, it's a series. It's not a list. So we convert that to list, meaning uh, now we can and then convert that to NumPy array. Basically, after this operation, your X should be, if you go back up, sorry, if you go back up, your X should be an array of unsigned integers because these are all uh, 0 to 255, right? 8-bit. I have 3,500 images, 32 by 32 by 3. Okay, so far so good. First thing first, let's normalize it. You can normalize it. I'm going to scale right now, just by dividing values by 255. I know that the minimum pixel is zero, the maximum is 255. So just by doing this, it will become a float. Now come back here, look at this. This is an array of floating point values. And you can see that in the numbers up here. Okay, great. Now let's, uh, our, we are ready with X. What is our Y? Our Y is uh, the column with the label of label, not the DX because it doesn't know what to do with DX, right? So our label is either zero or one or two or three and so on up to six. So let's go ahead and assign that to Y and you should see right away right here, it's a series of uh, 3,500 values, uh, either zero, one, two, three, four, or five or six, okay? So this is our Y. Now. Uh, this is not good enough for deep learning. That's good for if you want to do random forest or something else. But for deep learning, uh, you know, the way we structure this, we need to convert that into categorical because this is a multi-class classification. So all you need to do is two categorical and 
it should be converted right away let's open y cat which is our categorical now you can see all the labels with a value of zero they are all one heart encode i mean everything is one heart encoded you can see a uh, one right here this is one heart because one pixel has a value of one representing what class it is all other pixels are zero so if i go to here these are all you know ones and every other entry in that row should be zero okay that's a quick crash course on one heart or uh, two categorical or one heart encoding we are all set we just need to divide our x and y into training and validation data sets so that's exactly what i'm doing right, right here so i'm holding out 25 percent for training uh, sorry for testing and remaining 75 percent uh, for training so finally we are there our X train is, uh, we have 2,625 data points and uh, our testing, we have 875 images, okay? Fine, finally, what are we going to do? Put the model together. This is the easy part. Handling the data is always uh, the one that takes the longest time. This is the easy part. In fact, you can swap this with a different model. Uh, the best way to do this is have a, uh, have a separate Python file with all your models in there and just import whatever model you want, apply it, and see how the accuracy looks like, okay? But in this case, I'm defining this as uh, you see here, okay? And uh, again, I'm doing this because this is exactly what my uh, auto Keras actually told me would be uh, the best one for this, okay? It, it didn't try 100 different models, it tried 25. Of those 25, this is the best, okay? So uh, again, uh, the input images, and uh, finally you have seven, uh, you know, dense layer giving seven outputs, right? Um, each containing, because we are using softmax, each of these seven is a uh, probability, and then we'll take uh, the highest probability as our class, that's it. Uh, Okay, so there you go. Now we are all set to go ahead and fit it. So let's do 50 epochs of a batch size of 16 each. Again, if you use image data generator, you may get slightly better accuracy because you're randomly sampling from your folder and you're getting new images all the time. But now I only have 875, no, uh, three, how many, 2625 images. Still okay, we'll see. Uh, Okay, so uh, how do we fit this? Again, model.fit, if you're using generator, model.fit generator, and X train, Y train, number of epochs, everything is fine. Let's go ahead and run this, and uh, let's see how long it takes. Literally, this is the first time. This is usually not the kind of thing you do while, while recording a video, right? Don't test it out uh, during the live. <laughs> test it out first, but uh, these things uh, take time, but uh, I'll pause the video, but let's let's, have a quick look at the first epoch. Oh, that's not bad. It's done with the first epoch. Now it's doing the second one. So looks like it's not going to be an hour of pausing the video, but uh, maybe a few minutes. Let's look at the next next iteration and then I'll pause. I'll pause the video. Okay, so that's good. Uh, loss accuracy, validation accuracy is heading in the right direction. Right now we are at 28%. That's not encouraging but let's see where it ends up okay let me pause the video and uh, continue after this is done with 50 epochs so okay there you go so after 50 epochs we got an accuracy of about 69 percent on the validation data in fact it wanted to go up to 74 at one point and if i probably add 50 more epochs maybe we would have gotten 75-ish or something uh, or maybe even 80 I don't know well let's look at how the how the loss curves uh, look like first of all let's go ahead and print the test accuracy just uh, for the sanity check it should be about 69 percent right so we already know that 69 uh, percent right there now let us look at uh, the both the uh, loss curves and the accuracy curves so let's plot them together well, separately, but uh, right there. So here is the loss. That's not bad. That's actually heading in the right direction. There is no overfitting going on. Both the training and validation are kind of riding together down. And as I can see, just maybe 10 more, 20 more epochs I would have gotten. Uh, I would have gotten probably 75-ish or something. It seems to be saturating right around there or 80 i'll let you guys uh, again uh, work on this on your own time but th these are excellent looking uh, curves 
in my point of view. Thanks to Otto Keras for suggesting something that uh, potentially works. Uh, now, what do you do? Again, just to finish this uh, out, uh, let's go ahead and print our confusion matrix. And how do you do that? First of all, you do your predictions on the testing data set. How do you do? First of all, model.predict. Now we have a model. You are going to predict it. And uh, when you predict it, these are going to be one hot encoded vectors, correct? So if you look at why predict, these are all uh, uh, actually, sorry, a step back. These are all probabilities. Remember, we are using softmax. So our predictions are all. Um, uh, probability. So here, if you look at the zeroth one, this is 34% uh, confident that it belongs to uh, class zero. And if you keep going, that's probably, no, this is the highest one, 35.6. In fact, it's between zero and three. Very close. Everything else slightly lower, right? So first, let's convert this into one hot encoded, okay, which is basically arg max converts this into, okay, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so that's what argmax actually does. So let's go ahead and do the argmax along that axis and go ahead and look at why predict classes. And, oh, sorry, argmax actually does the entire thing. It actually tells you exactly where the maximum, maximum probability, or in this case, maximum probability, right, our maximum value is. It's at the column number three or value number three, so it puts three here. So we don't have to go through that exercise. Uh, so anyway, so this is this is our final uh, predictions. Now, if you want to compare this to, uh, if you want to compare this to your true values, let's also convert our true values because if you look at the test, test, these are all one hot encoded. Let's take argmax. All it's doing is three, four, four, and so on, right? So let's do that even for our true. There you go. And let's print out confusion matrix. Confusion matrix is true, predicted. OK. And this is where I like uh, Seaborn heat map. So it gives us a nice visualization of this heat map like there. Not bad. It's doing pretty good over there. And uh, for this class, it's actually doing very good. Class number six. Uh, not so good here. Some of these classes can be better. Looking at confusion matrix is not really that, uh, you know, uh, it's helpful, but <laughs> we can do something else. What I'm trying to do here is plot a fractional incorrect misclassification. So for classification zero, how many, what percentage of these are incorrectly classified, right? So let's just go ahead and plot them as a bar plot. So you can see about 30% or so, 35, 37, 38% are incorrectly classi uh, classified. For label four, more than 50% are incorrectly classified. So if you are very much interested in whatever that label four is, then you have to think about how to kind of uh, get this, uh, get this uh, uh, slightly better. My my guess is if you look at label four or five, uh, probably, in fact, uh, label four or five, do we have an easy way? I don't want to extend this any further than uh, we need. I'll, I'll let you guys explore that. But my, my uh, guess would be some of these highly misclassified ones are the ones where we only have 100 images, but we are augmenting to 500. And the best ones like six, for example, label six is the one where we have a lot of images and we are kind of undersampling or something. That's just a guess. It could be that label six is the easy one. You just look at the image, you can say, hey, this is this, right? So the, those things work very well, uh, even in deep learning, just like uh, manually. Uh, okay, so I think this uh, should conclude this video and I really hope you learned how to handle the data, how to pre-process it, and model part is the easy part. Doing machine learning is the easy part. You have to learn uh, how to handle this data and uh, how to display or how to analyze your results. I hope, again, you found this tutorial to be very useful. Go ahead and subscribe to this button because if you have spent 25 minutes watching this video, there's no reason not to subscribe and then watch future videos that may be very useful for you. Okay, thank you very much.